many of them, and we broke ground there and decided we were going to build a federation. And uh, Excuse me, the federation exists elsewhere. On 441 right now. I mean, it exists not just in Boca. This isn't something you invented here. No, this is, federations are all over the world now, different areas. And this federation uh, started in, uh, I forget when we broke ground. I have it written down. Well, I know it was established in 79. Well, that's, that's when it was. Uh, um, we put the first shovel in the ground and said someday we're going to have a lot of nice buildings, a school, a uh, nice place for the elderly, uh, a lot of wonderful things, and wonderful things happened there. And is that what defines a federation, wherever it is? Yes, a federation is a federation, a conglomerate of different buildings being built for the Jewish community and anybody else that wants to go to school with us there. And each has its own individual business, so to speak, that runs. Let me give you, for instance, if you, mm -hmm. you want to get to Jock. Jock is a friend of mine, had a mongoloid son from Washington, moved down here and lived here. and wanted to know where he could place his son, and he, he was a prominent dentist in Washington, retired, and couldn't find a place, and said he'd like to build some places for children like this. And occasionally became discouraged in wanting to do this, and the Federation, which is the main part of the group, was run by Bruce Warshall, and money would come into that group, and he would palm it out to different people, like the Jock or Ruth Rails Jewish Center or any one of the buildings that are there. And what does JARC stand for? Jewish Association Community for, for Retarded Children. Jock, that's Jock. That was when my friend decided and he'd get discouraged once in a while, I would encourage him on. And encourage him on and financially back him. Do you want to tell me his name? Yes, uh, Dr. Clayman. Melvin Clayman. Melvin Clayman. Yes. And uh, uh, we decided to build and fund a home for six suites for six children, all mongoloid. That's Down syndrome, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we built that one. And I named them after former employees of mine. Morris Sampson, who was my CEO. Uh, uh, Stell Edelstein, who was uh, handled my Apple Valley project. Mel Rosenblatt, uh, Holmes different homes under their names. And it's a very fascinating story there. These are mongoloid children where today we have a hundred of them in there, okay? And every parent who has a mongoloid child trying to get into that place, jock, because of the reputation, the beauty of it, the homes are beautiful, suites for the children. And to digress just a little, very difficult to get the property. When we would get the property and buy it, and the community would find out that mongoloid children were going to be in there, they wanted to null and void, and we had an awful tough time getting them to finally agree, and compensating them in a prudent and proper manner. And now they live with them and they're very happy with them. But 
Are all of all are all excuse me, are all of the homes in Boca Raton that are associated with JAR? No, no, no. I'm building now four of them. The basis is in Boca Raton on 441 and uh, uh, Glades Road, mm -hmm. the whole Jewish community there. Uh, but I'm building four now on 441 in a shopping center there. Uh, that'll be done in August. But, but the, the beauty part of the Mongoloid children is that the world has passed them by. Oh, there's some kind of freaks. There's some kind of whatever. And then the parents who raise these children and have three or four other children that are perfect, of reaching the age of 70 years old or thereabouts and say, I wonder who's going to take care of Richard when my wife and I live. My children are embarrassed to bring their friends over the house. We can't travel because we want to take him with us. He's dependent on us. And they don't want to accept us, my brothers, sisters, or whatever. And they call a family meeting. And they say to the children, now we're 70 years old and we're short for this world. Who's going to take care of Richard when we're gone? And inevitably, the children say, give us the money. We'll take care of him. And the parents say, well, during their lifetime, you didn't take care of him. You didn't want to be seen with him. Now, why do we want to give you the money to take care of him? You'll institutionalize him. So they come to Jock. Now they have this beautiful place, and you got to go up to see it. I mean, uh, each home is like $600,000, which, going back 10 or 15 years ago, was a lot of money in building these homes for these children. And not just building them, but... But oh, funding them right. and, and having 24-hour uh, uh, people there. And, and, and uh, the first two weeks they come there, and every week we would let them go home for the weekend. And then after two weeks, they would say to their parents, take me home. I want to be with my friends. See? And they've integrated in there where today we have them dancing, singing, we have them on computers, they work in, uh, in the uh, supermarkets, they uh, make lunches and dinners for people in the, we have one big property there where we have a kitchen and great facilities for them. And it, just to see them in their own little world singing God Bless America, and, and it's such a wonderful feeling to watch these uh, people live a life that the world was going to pass them by on. See? Um, so you're very involved with JARC, and obviously you're involved with family services. Oh, yes, tell, very tell, much so. Tell about, me how that, about your involvement there, how that well, came about. I, I, my wife was pretty ill for many years. Uh, let's, let's just clarify that. She was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, pretty ill for a number of years, like 10 or 12 years. And was told the first year she's got a year to live, and thank God. She lived on. and. Uh, I wanted to dedicate a place to her. And we have uh, Ruth Rails, uh, where we have maybe a couple of hundred employees. And you did that while she was still alive? Right? Yes, she was still that, alive. We just, life. we had begun for a couple of years. Now it's really come into a huge facility. And as I told you earlier on, we. 
we serve the people in Delray and all the folks. And, and there are many Jewish families, contrary to the thinking of other people, who are very poor. And they, they need psychiatric treatment, they need help, they need doctors, which we provide at Ruth Rails for them. See? And uh, we're happy to do that, and we'll continue to do that in a better manner for all people in Boca and all people in and around the community. You have um, a foundation? I have a foundation, which we've worked with the hospital, the Boca Hospital, and we built the, the whole ninth floor for a couple million dollars. When did you form the foundation? When did I? 20 years ago. Maybe more, um, I would say 20 years for sure. And how do you decide? I'm sure when you have a foundation like that, there's probably a lot of people that come to you. Um, indeed there are. You know, for and I'm happy to serve a them. Lot of them. Those that, that... What kind of criteria do you use to decide? Well, initially I would go out and visit a facility, see their statement, see what they're doing with it how they're running it. I, well, unbeknown to many people, there's an orphanage right here in Boca. What's it called? Oh, I forget the name of it. Okay. It's right near the country club there, and they had 20 orphans there, right up my alley. <laughs> but then when I went over it, they had 40 employees. And I said, you can't get my money. You've got to have 10 employees to take care of these 20 people, not 40. I'm not funding you folks for a living. Mm -hmm. There's other people who need this money, and I want to fund them. So I would go and visit them, and I would talk to them, and I'd go over their statement and see that they're 100% trying to do things in the correct manner. So you, you would, would you say your, um, your main areas of, of giving that you're interested in um, would be helping children and helping really anybody who is um, unfortunate? In, and in helping need. older folks. And That's a very important mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. to uh, uh, help the older folks mm -hmm. who can't help themselves. We built a building in uh, right on the Federation premises, 103 units with balconies and uh, swimming pool and surrounded by the high school and the children's school there and Nobody's income can be over $11,000 a year, and they have to be 65 years old or older to fill out an application. Now, can you imagine living on $11,000 a year? Certainly not in Boca Raton. Now they had a beautiful one bedroom or two bedroom apartment with a balcony in their wildest dreams. They never ever dreamt they'd have anything like that. What's the name of that facility? It's uh, part of the Federation. Okay. Yes, okay. part of the Federation. And that was being that, that I spent a lot of my time in Washington. We were able to get a nice grant towards building that building. Going back to how the Federation is set up, there's all these different agencies, they call them. All run on our own. And are the agencies owned by the Federation? Yes, the Federation okay. is the overall donator of some money to the Federation. Well, like anything else, the, the Ruth Rails, the Jocks, the other places are starting to feel their own oats and they, they do their own fundraising, and they want to be on their own. 
So they take less and less from the Federation. Because they don't want to be dictated to by the Federation's policies. Each of the people in charge of their different places, pretty good folks. Mm -hmm. Does the Federation maintain control? Or is, is there something legally that binds them? Oh, yes, I think so. There yeah. is something okay. that legally binds them. Mm -hmm. But did all of those agencies start after the Federation? Did the Federation, in other words, create each one of them? or were some That of came already? after the Federation was built. Okay. So after the first, first building. The Federation was... and then all of the agencies. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Um, you've received recognition for your generosity from time to time, I imagine. From Never looking for it, I know, although I'm, I'm talking sure about it here. That's okay. That's I, what I, we're here I, for. I have no interest I, in that. I'm force you to tell me about the recognition that you've received. I have <laughs> no interest in what I've done or how I've done it or what it's been. I do not, the recognition I like is when I'm in the mall and an elderly parent comes to me and says, Norman, and they kiss me. And say, you don't know what you did for me and my wife by taking so-and-so Richard in the jock. I now visit my brother in California who I haven't seen for 40 years. My wife goes to her sister up in Philadelphia and you started a whole new romance between my wife and I because we know Richard is comfortable and we see him all the time and he loves being there. That's the recognition I look for and enjoy the most. See? Not any newspaper articles, not anything like that. More often than not, when I'm recognized by a newspaper, I say I have no comment. Well, just for the record, since this is about you, um, I'd like to mention that um, you were added last year in 2007 to the Boca Raton Walk of Recognition. Mm -hmm. And uh, not too many people have have that honor. Thank you. So you're special here in Boca. I consider it a privilege. I'm a lover of Boca Raton. And I'm sure that you've had many other uh, forms of recognition, but that one I wanted to make sure mm -hmm. we mentioned. Some people work hard all their lives, and then they, um, when they have time, when they retire, they sort of rediscover their roots and their Jewish identity. Would you say that that, can you relate to that at all? Did that happen to you or, or was it just there all the time? I guess you do have some who uh, not only first recognize, but even though they recognize it, they're not charitable people. And they don't know what they're missing, unfortunately for them good feeling of giving, you mean? Oh, what a wonderful feeling that is. My God. Just to see the things and see what's happened and how you made someone's life a little better and how you've been able to bring people together. Uh, families that uh, battle trying to bring them together and show them there are other important things besides battle. You want to win the war. And winning the war is being together with your family. Mm -hmm. I read a quote from the Jewish Times. It said, as Jewish as South County is, it is not, as Jackie Mason would say, Jewish enough. Well, that, Can you tell me what Jewish enough means? Well, that could be put in by Orthodox Jews who think everybody should be an Orthodox Jew. And it's not Jewish enough mm -hmm. when you're not. Mm -hmm. So See? strict or more disciplined? Yes, yeah, like, like you even have that in Israel today. 
my God, the, the, the Orthodox Jew is uh, causing conflicts there that should not be. Have you been very political at all? I know a lot of our, the Jewish community here is very political um, with the State of Israel bonds and so forth. Um, I contribute to that. Family does too. Political in the sense, do I know any of the politicians? Or? No, I was just wondering if you are active or have been in the past active uh, as far as trying to change things in, in ways other than your philanthropy. Yes, I, I like to make America a better place for everybody to live in. I have my own opinions of who I think should be president and mm -hmm. why they should be president. And I was uh, a great Hillary fan, and I was sorry to see her lose. I, I'd like to see a woman uh, who, uh, for 100 years, uh, had women's suffrage, and she had a chance to change that a lot for the women. And I thought she could do a good job, see? And, uh, but unfortunately, she didn't get in. She's a very bright young lady, highly intelligent, concerned for the welfare of the people of the world, and has the experience to go with it. And it so happens that she had a bad incident with her husband. But, uh, America being what it is, every president before him had their own love affairs and he got caught. Johnson, Kennedy, Kennedy was the worst. My God. And Roosevelt had his sweetheart. Eisenhower had his girlfriend in England. And Clinton got caught. Were you acquainted with President Clinton? I beg your pardon? Were you acquainted with President Clinton? Yes, I knew Bill Clinton, yes. I knew uh, Carter. Carter, I can tell you, relate a nice story to you. And Carter, in Washington one day, being friendly with Maury Povich, I don't know if you know who he is, mm -hmm. but Maury, for a while, was the top gun in Washington, D.C., from television before he moved to New York. And he came to my office and he said, Norm, I have a gentleman with me that uh, is considering running for the nomination for the presidency of the United States. He'd like to talk to you. I said, fine, send him in, come on. And Jimmy Carter came in, say. And he said, my name is Jimmy Carter. And I said, I'm Norman Rails, how do you do, sir? And he said, I'm thinking of running for the presidency of the United States. I said, well, tell me what you want to do for the United States, uh, Mr. Carter. And he said, uh, uh, you know, I'm a former governor of the state of Georgia, so I have some. I said, I didn't know that, Mr. Carter. I really didn't. He said, and I went to school right here close by to Washington in Annapolis. And I'm a graduate of the Naval Academy. I said, I didn't know that either, Mr. Carter. He said, call me Jimmy. I said, okay, Jimmy. And we talked for about a half hour. And when we finished, I said, candidly, uh, Jimmy, I haven't decided who I'm gonna back for the nomination for the presidency. And I reached into my pocket and I had one of those one dollar big red pens and it had my name on it, Norman R. Rails. And I used to give them out once in a while. And I reached into my pocket and I said, when I realize what I'm gonna do, I'll let you know, Jimmy. I said, in the meantime, I'm gonna give you this pen. And if you stroke this the right way, not only will you be nominated for the Democratic Party, you'll be the President of the United States. Well, he laughed and I laughed. We shook hands and he left. And lo and behold, a year later, I came home from work. At that time, 
they were printing the Washington Star, and on the front page, big as I'm doing now, President-elect Jimmy Carter vacationing in Sea Island, Georgia, before the inauguration two weeks hence. And the pen is open in his mouth, and it says, Norman R. Rail. Well, I let out a scream, and my wife come running in. She said, what happened? I said, Ruth, take a look at that picture. And there was Jimmy Carter, went on Newsweek the following week, all over the world in the magazine. <laughs> they, oh, that's funny. Now, I was known then in Washington as a fellow with the good luck pen. And Fritz Mondell, who was the vice president, and Joan Mondell, they would drive me crazy. They wanted a pen. Give me a good luck pen. And you know, all those people I would go to shows with, you got another good luck pen, Norman. But that, that really happened. I have to ask you, did you vote for him? I voted for him the first time. Okay. The second time, I didn't vote for him simply because he had his right-hand man I'm trying to think of his name. He was a banker, right-hand man from Georgia, who was a banker, had a good-sized bank, and Mr. Carter used to use his airplane to fly around everywhere, and some client of the bankers, who he knew, the banker knew for, for many years, said, I have this check for $200,000. I don't have 200000 in the bank, but I'll have it in there tomorrow morning. Would you cash the check for me? And he did. See? And the next morning, man came in with the money and gave him the money. The newspaper or media picked that up somehow. And before you know it, he was known as cashing a bad check for someone and, and came before, Mr. President, what are you going to do about your right-hand man? And President Carter fired him. Well, I didn't believe in that. See? This was a man who helped him get elected. This was a man who lived by him. And the man really knew he was doing something wrong, but didn't think he was doing something wrong, because he knew the man for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I didn't vote for Carter the second time around. The man went to trial and was found not guilty. And I was mad as hell at Carter then. See, for doing that. President Truman, unlike Carter, prior to Carter, when his man, Vaughn, they came because before Truman and said, your man, Vaughn, got a refrigerator from General Electric, and they put it in his house. What are you going to do about that, Mr. Truman, or President Truman? And he rubbed his chin. He said, I know what I'm going to do about that. I'm going to tell him never to do that again. <laughs> see? Well, those are two different folks, you see. Jimmy Carter, in my opinion, didn't have it. So I didn't vote for him the second time around. Um, education was a focus of the Federation from the very beginning. Um, education of, uh, as far as Jewish history, Jewish culture, right? Is that true of every federation? Is that a basic? Probably, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions about the community that you may or may not have direct knowledge of. If you don't have direct knowledge of it, just we'll just skip it, okay? Because I can um, um, perhaps ask some other people about it. Um, do you have any direct knowledge of the beginnings of the Lifelong Learning Center? The Learning Center? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
We all, I have some passing fancy with it, but not really digging in very much. Okay, well, we'll just skip over that then. Um, are you very familiar with the American Jewish Committee and Bill Graunick? Yeah, I have some passing fancy with that too. Okay. Uh, there was a rash of anti-Semitic incidents um, in 1988, 1990, and 1993. And, and one of them, as a matter of fact, was at the Federation. The others were just were in the community here. Uh, and in 1990, Florida was fifth in the country for such incidents. Um, and yet it has the strongest hate crime laws in the country. Do you know um, why at that particular time those incidents were prevalent? Was there something going on that? I, I think the thing that might have been going on was that the Jewish people were moving into the community in abundance, and the Christian people really resented that, and that was a way of them uh, getting back at it mm -hmm. as best they could, mm -hmm. they thought. And sometimes people react that way out of fear. Uh, fear of the unknown. Still is some. Mm. But do they still do things like that still happen from time to time? No, but they let you know who you are. Mm. Say. I see. Um, the Jewish community of South County has supported social causes outside of its federation. I mean, it has, it's, it has its causes within the Federation, the, the agencies there. But it seems like the Federation, or, or certainly the, the main people in the Federation, also support other social causes that are not part of them. And, and also support Israel. And yeah. a, a certain amount of money that comes into the Federation is dedicated to Israel. Oh, I see. It's, yeah. it's like a percentage that just so when uh, you give to the Federation, you know that you're also supporting Israel. That's right. Okay. Um, so the Federation has um, also supported the daily, the daily bread food bank of Palm Beach County and migrant farm workers and um, aid to victims of domestic assault and uh, um, several medical facilities. Do you, have you had any involvement with any of those? Well, medical facilities, I was involved with the Boca Raton Hospital. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. to a great extent. Different things mm -hmm. we've been able to do there, and I've been a contributor both financially and hopefully some of the things I say make some sense to them. I'm very friendly with Gloria Drummond. I'm very friendly with the Thomases. Uh, uh, Is Gloria Drummond the mother of the, yes, of the, chil the children? Yes, of Boca Raton Hospital. You know how that happened, don't you? Her children died. The babysitter poisoned them. Accidentally, right? Pardon? Accidentally. Oh, not accidentally. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, not accidentally, but however, there are different concepts of why, how it happened and what happened. And she tried to get them into the hospital. There was no hospital there. So she started to build a hospital. Okay. And the community obviously supported her. Yep, rightfully so. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Have you been involved in any interfaith uh, efforts or relationships. I know that some of the things that have been achieved have been achieved through interfaith relationships, particularly through Temple Beth El, which, um, which I'm involved in almost every church in the community. I'm a contributor to all churches, all things for children that I send to them, besides financial money, 
shirts and different things. Marlin shirts, which you know I'm involved with the Marlins and one of the owners of the Marlins. And I, I take them to ball games and have different days for different uh, children there of all faiths and still do and will continue to till the day I die. That's wonderful. Yeah, I like it. I have a lot of fun. You know what it is to take a group of children and march them on the field and let them look at the stands and meet the ball players and what that does for kids. My God, they never forget that the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. right? And people did that for me when I was a kid. I liked it, although I... Would you say that's your personal philosophy? If you, if you had a personal philosophy, what would it be? Taking care of the children and the elderly and contributing to all of the people. I'm a big contributor to St. Henry's Church. I go there when my wife passed away. We were the first Jewish people they had mass for. It was wonderful to see those people. And that's what brings everybody together. You see it, and, they, and people begin to understand each other. Instead of some of the hearsay that they get that is not correct and not true. Well, you had that same incident here. There's two country clubs here. Two golf courses, big country clubs. One was the hotel, and then there's the, or was the, country club in Royal Palm and the very highfalutin Christian people. And they had, in the minutes, no Jews allowed, no Catholics, and uh, uh, no black. 10 or 12 years ago, the chairman of the board's daughter married a Jewish boy. And uh, unbeknown to the father, educated but ignorant. How come, Mary? You used to love to go to the club. Now we don't see you here anymore. The father talking to the daughter. And she said, Daddy, you know I married a Jewish man. And he's my husband. They won't allow him in there. And he said, how dare they? I'll change those rules. So he called a meeting. And the board of directors said, no, you're not going to change it. You initiated these laws. He said, well, I want to change. They said, no. And he sued every board of directors. Well, now you have Jewish people in the country club. But that's the hard way, see? And these are the things that I, I, I can't conceive of what makes people think along those lines, what they do, whatever it is. In my day, when I, 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 as I said, I wanted to go get a job, you had to fill out your religion. And I would say Hebrew. General Electric says the job's filled, okay? Alcoa, your job's filled, as soon as they saw Hebrew. Why? I don't know. Highly intelligent people. Well, I think that ignorance is um, a big part of it, which is partly why we are doing what we're doing today. We're, edu we're going well, to educate right. people. You're absolutely correct. Um, what would you personally like to see for the future of the Federation and the Jewish community here in Boca? I would like to see it keep on flourishing in the manner in which it's flourishing, keep it up, get many charitable people to deliver to the Federation so the Federation can spread out and deliver to the whole community and communities around it so that everybody becomes a recipient of some of the money that comes in there and some of the things that it's capable of doing, such as psychiatry, dentistry we have, different things that people 
come in to get, even today. So aside from more of the same to reach more people, is there anything that they're not doing that you would like to see them do? I like to if see. You were, if you were, in, you know, I like to see them show. quit arguing with each other, but that's <laughs> a tendency for Jewish people to do. <laughs> well, for all people, probably, right? Yeah, well, uh, um, but I, I'd like to see them just continue to make America a better place for everybody to live in, and I'm a prime example of what America offers you if you really want it. Let somebody tell me, forget about being Jewish. These Americans, these this, 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 this. I say, you got the wrong guy you're talking to. That's not true. Although we have a situation presently for some reason, and I think it's obvious that the world don't like us. You either go my way or you go the highway, the guy's saying. If you don't want to do what we want to do, we're going to invade you. We're going to go into Iraq. We're going to, we don't belong there. We don't belong in these places. But we have that, and, and what makes us American is we can say that where they can't, see? And I was, uh, several years ago, maybe 10, I was sent on an assignment to Cuba and indoctrinated with that the people will come and give you a slip of paper, get me out of here. Always your answer is, no, I can't do anything for you because you don't know when Mr. Castro gave that guy the paper to nab you, see? And I had a beautiful young ardent communist take me around Cuba, flew me, might have been 30 years old, flew me to Santiago and the different places that I had to go. And I spent a week with him traveling around. And he said, how did you like my Cuba, Mr. Rails? I said, Cuba is beautiful. It's a beautiful country. People are beautiful, They're very, very nice. But his name was David, that's it. I said, David, I want to show you what we have. So I'm going to take you back with me and show you what America is. And he looked at me and he smiled. And he says, you know I can't go back with you. I said, then you don't know what freedom is. You know what that man tells you every day on the television, how good you got it. Maybe you do, but let's see what everybody else does. And he couldn't come back with me. I said, do you know, David, that people leave your country on small rafts and they're eaten by sharks, families, to get out of there to come to America? I said, you're entitled to that. Not according to him, though. No. See? At any rate, the, the, the America is the greatest country in the world, the greatest nation in the world. We offer the world so much, and uh, but we don't deserve to invade people if they don't want to see our way of life. I'm hoping that whoever the next president is, he has the wherewithal to negotiate and put deals together for America without fighting. I, I know if I was president, I'd go right to Venezuela. And I would say, Chavez, what do you want? We have things you might want. You have enough oil to keep us going for 50 years. You're sending it to China, you're sending it all over, you could send it right to us. Now, what can we do to work together in a prudent and proper manner that makes these countries better for both of us? Why should Chavez be buying his goods from the Soviet Union or somewhere else 
when we make the same goods here. Mm -hmm. And I know what Chavez will say. The first thing I want from you is quit trying to assassinate me. Stop that. See? Well, he's absolutely correct in my opinion. How do you negotiate if you're going to kill a guy? You've got to negotiate in the right manner. Don't always work your way. Whether you're married or not, you're negotiating with your wife. How do you do this right? How do you fare? What is it you need, darling? What can I do with you? There is such a thing as fair fighting. I carry it on my refrigerator. Give the next person a chance to talk. Don't dominate it. See? There's two, two um, little things that... Don't get me on America, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> there, there are two little things that, that I, I want to ask you, um, and then I'm going to ask if there's anything else you would like to talk about. But um, one is, you mentioned earlier that you had an interest in thoroughbred racing, and you got your box down at Gulfstream. Um, and you didn't mention the fact that you bought horses and maybe still... Say that again. Do you still yes. own horses? You, you did own horses. I still own a couple of horses. Okay. But even the bad ones eat as much as the good ones. <laughs> so it's hard to make money in the, in the racing business. Well, I thought... I thought uh, I and thought, it's thrilling, though. Uh-huh. Do you have any idea what it is when... when when you see your horse coming down and you say, go get him, come on now, you know, and it's such a thrill to see that. Well, I, I noticed that you had one horse, uh, and I just wanted to mention its name because I thought it was great, um, Amsterdam Avenue. Yep, that's what street I lived on. In the, in and that's, the that's how I knew that you didn't live in the one in Brooklyn, when I saw the horse's name. Yep. Um, that, that told me right there. And he won, at least what I read. Yeah, he, he did. And I had a few horses <laughs> that won. Them. Big Teddy K, one of the boys who was on a basketball team with me. Oh. I think he won six races. And so. one of your horses was named Wonderful HOA. Yeah, that's right. Didn't win a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted you to explain to me. Um, it doesn't really have anything to do with Boca or the Jewish community, but I just, it is part of your personal record. Um, tell me about when you uh, sold, how you sold your company, when you, when you got out of the uh, Mid-South Building Supply. That was pretty interesting. I had wonderful employees. I was very privileged to have all these wonderful folks work with us. And... At that age, I might have been 50, and I decided retirement was in order. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but uh, and several of the employees got a notion that I was going to sell the business. And uh, is there any way we can buy it, Mr. Rails? And then I started to research what is known as the ESOP plan. And we were the first people in America to incorporate the ESOP plan because it was during the period that the Soviet Union was getting very strong under communism. And in America, we wanted to do something for people who could own their own business and make it flourish. And I said to uh, this employee, yes, that's true, I, I am going to sell the business. And well, he said, we worked very hard and we made you rich. I said, indeed you did. And I, I feel very respectful for all of you. So let me see what I can work out. And I went to the ESOP plan. Employees, something to confront the Soviet Union by doing things for your working people. 
And I sold them maybe at the point, I think it was somewhere around $10 million. I sold them the business. And they said, how are we going to pay for this? We don't have any money. I said, that's true. But the other part is true also, that you made me rich. So I'm going to sign a note for you people for $10 million. And you people are going to pay the bank off. Well, the interesting concept with that that I learned from that, not only did they pay it off, I got them a 10-year loan. But while they were working with me, they said, you know, Mr. Rails, we work 10 hours a day, five days a week. We need some more help. And I said, well, if you need some more help, tell me and we'll talk it over and see. They always needed more help. No matter the bookkeepers, everybody needed more help. Now, when they bought the business under the ESOP plan, they owned the business, all the employees. As it, in the end result, the truck driver became worth $250,000 and so on down the line as it went. But when an employee left, they wouldn't hire another employee because he would get a piece of their action now and they wanted it all. So it was wonderful to watch that operate and see how they did that. Now, instead of paying that off in 10 years, they paid it off in three and a half years. Wow. Okay? To this day, I go into Mid-South, whichever branch, we kiss each other and the guy says, never in my wildest dream did I ever think I'd have this money. They had a kids' education, everything was, at any rate, worked out fine. Well, you have certainly made many, many, many people's lives better in so many ways, in so many places. And we're, we're very glad that you're, that you're living here in Boca, because you're really making an impact here, too. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to say or talk about? Well, politically, I got involved in some degrees in Washington because I lived all around those folks. And some of them were very nice and very conscious of trying to do the right thing for America. And right in your county, I got a nice story to tell you. Is, uh, Tim Mahoney is a congressman from your area, Palm Beach and in that area. Tim Mahoney was running as an opponent two years ago against a fellow who was a 10 to 1 favorite to beat this in new guy who never was in politics, Tim Mahoney. And the Democratic Party said, why don't you run and we'll try to do what we can to back you. My very good friend from up in Washington, called me and said he's going to be down to see Tim Mahoney. And would I go to meet with Tim Mahoney? And I said, yes, I would. And we went down and we met with Tim Mahoney. And Tim Mahoney was running against Foley. Mm -hmm. Mark Foley. Yeah, at any rate, Foley and Mahoney is telling me I'm a 10 to 1 underdog. I, I can't uh, how, know how, win it. And like I gave these two gentlemen a silver dollar, I gave that to Mahoney. And I said, you rub this the right way, and you're going to be elected to Congress. Well, the next day, the whole thing broke loose <laughs> on Foley and what he did with the children in the Washington. And Mahoney was elected. He <laughs> called me just the other day when we're going to have lunch together. And he was elected. He keep, cherishes that silver dollar. Okay. Never got rid of it. And I could tell you lots of nice stories about silver dollars that I had the privilege to give to people. And they handled it the right way. And 
Many of them have had a lot of luck with it, see? A lot of luck with it. Well, it's faith, isn't it? When you have faith. Oh, yes. Yeah, so. yeah. People have faith in different things, but... No question about that. No mm -hmm. question about it. I, I'll meet people today, and uh, I've forgotten I've given it to them, mm -hmm. and they remind me. I was in Washington. How, I stopped at Starbucks for coffee one day, and the fellow says, don't you remember me? I said, forgive me. I haven't been back for a while. He said, you gave my son a silver dollar. That guy has been lucky ever since he's gotten it. <laughs> well, they remember, see? And it's a privilege. I like doing that, and I like to keep people happy. And those that are unhappy, I try to turn around, see? I want to ask you one question that is, is um, a painful subject. Um, and I don't mean to, to end on, on a sad note, um, then you don't, of course, have to answer it if you don't want to, but I know your wife meant an awful lot to you. And even though you knew you were going to leave, lose her for a long time before it actually happened, what, uh, what kept you together? Because- Faith is one, but we both knew she was dying. You know. The best I can relate to you is that we were in bed together, and I said, Ruth, one of us is going to go before the other, whoever it's going to be, is going to be. So you wait on a star if it's you, and I'll come and get you. But I want you to understand one thing, that if I go up there and find you, which I expect I will, I don't want a house, I want a condo. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you left, she left, and a couple hours later she passed away. Oh my. See? See? So but she was, she was a wonderful lady who very dedicated, fiercely dedicated to her children. And didn't take any guff from them. But many a time, they were big six-footers, still are. They'd hold her head, and she'd be swinging up. <laughs> I asked you before, you told me what you thought, uh, what, what you, well, we talked about what your boys learned from you. Um, what would you say that was their greatest gift from their mother that they received from their mother? Kind. She was considerate. Very charitable. Dedicated, as I say, to her children. Took care of, worked while I worked. Helped me through the years very correct in most everything she did and said because she only wanted the right thing. Mm -hmm. There were various people have various things that they like. My wife, jewelry was not one of them. Uh, we were invited to every embassy in Washington without fail, and that was not one of her interests or mine. We never went to them. Occasionally, we had one embassy or two embassies we'd go to. But the everyday person was what she was concerned with and fiercely concerned with her children okay, till the day she passed. Only about her children. That's all she wanted to do, and do the right thing. And I learned a lot from her. Compassion, how to be gentle, how to do things in a prudent and proper manner for the best interest of every. I don't live by myself. I live in a country that allowed me to come in, be born here, 
how fortunate that was. And, uh, in all my travels, everybody wants to come to America. Everyone wants to, up until recently, everyone wanted to emulate the American way of life. The bourgeoisie, maybe, in these countries we would go into and show them how to produce their products and how to make more out of their products and how to make their country a little more wealthy and we, we wanted to be paid for it and profit was not a dirty word. The bourgeoisie who saw that what can happen kicked us out and that's why you have in Switzerland the the Idi Amin's got a three million billion dollar account. Marcos from from Philippines has a seven billion dollar account before he died in Switzerland, and they kicked us out of those countries because those guys wanted to do what they wanted. But the Americans wanted really the true people throughout the world really respected the Americans up until recent years. Well, I know you're very grateful to be an American, and uh, so am I. And I, I want to I tell you I'm very grateful that you agreed to do this, this talk together today. I've really enjoyed it, um, and I think a lot of good things will come out of it, just as good things have come out of so many other things you've done throughout your whole life. I appreciate the privilege of being able to be with you.